over one million immigrants from Germany, Austria, Lithuania, Ireland, Poland, Russia, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Italy, and other European nations arrived in Baltimore in the late 1800s and early 1900s, making Baltimore one of the busiest entry points during that time. Blocks and blocks of row houses were quickly erected to accommodate these new arrivals who moved into neighborhoods with fellow nationalities. Thus, Baltimore became a city with many ethnic neighborhoods and cultures, which it remains today. To our left, some of these communities are Harbor East, Little Italy, Fells Point, Canton, and Patterson Park. These are just a few of the hundreds of communities that together make up Baltimore, and within each, you find subtle pieces of the country. We will explore some of these neighborhoods in greater detail a little later. Also to the left, and a bit deeper into the city, are more than a dozen prestigious colleges and universities. Some of the most recognizable include the Johns Hopkins University, Peabody Conservatory of Music, University of Maryland at Baltimore, University of Baltimore, Loyola University, College of Notre Dame, Towson University, and Morgan State University, just to name a few. Back on our right is a community known as Locust Point. The large, tall structure with the modern glass facade is the old Baltimore and Ohio grain terminal. Constructed in 1923, it was the biggest and fastest grain elevator in the world. It jutted 290 feet into the air. The grain terminal was the pulse of the world's agricultural market in the new age of industrialism. Every year, Nearly 10 miles of conveyor belt carried 3.8 million bushels of grain from rail cars to transatlantic cargo ships. These vessels transported the grain to ports all over the world. In typical Baltimore style, it has been rehabbed, and today the 24-story tower houses luxury condominiums and is called Silo Point, again respecting its industrial heritage. Guys, maybe more impressive than the uh, former grain terminal over there at Silo Point are those massive gray ships we just passed, the Denebola and the Antares. Uh, we don't mention those in the narration because they're not always here. Uh, they are part of the Ready Reserve Fleet, uh, which is a fleet of boats that are stationed in various major ports around the country. Uh, they will be dispatched after natural disasters, um, not battleships or anything. They're operated by the Merchant Marines. You can see those red, white, and blue stripes up around the stacks. That's how you know they're Merchant Marines as opposed to um, uh, sea Lift Command, uh, which have very similar boats that are stationed around the country as well. Anyway, they'll be stocked up with anything they need to help uh, start the recovery process at uh, areas that are affected by natural disaster, hurricanes, earthquakes, that sort of thing. Uh, they're about a thousand feet long, and uh, despite their massive size, they're very quick through the water. They can do over 35 knots. Uh, just to put that into perspective here, uh, the Annapolitan 2 is 67 feet long, and on our best day with a good tailwind, we can maybe hit 14. So, uh, pretty impressive boats over there. It's not the Huskies, also, over here on our right-hand side, you'll see the Maryland Port Administration buildings. Uh, behind the Port Administration buildings, you'll see a cluster of mounds. And then if you look over on the left-hand side of the uh, river, river, you'll see another cluster of mounds over there. That's all uh, rock salt that's used for the roads uh, nah, during the winter time. Uh, Baltimore is the largest importer of uh, rock salt in the Mid-Atlantic region, so all the cities, counties, towns, uh, you name it in our area, will get their salt uh, from right here in Baltimore. As far west as Pittsburgh, south all the way down to Richmond, uh, will get their rock salt from right here in Baltimore.
guys will also briefly point out the uh, tugboats that we're passing over here on our right hand side. Uh, these are the Spanish, Spanish tugboats in Baltimore, and then there's another group up on our left hand side. Those are operated by Moran, which are two of the larger uh, tugboat companies here on the East Coast. Uh, you'll notice they have all those uh, rubber tires around the edge of the boat. Sometimes they not only are used as tugboats as in pulling, but they're also used almost as bumper boats to so bump right up against one of those large ships and just push them. Uh, tugboats have the equivalent, I've been told, of uh, two locomotive engines uh, operating the boat. So a whole lot of power in those things. I mean, they're, you know, one of those is big enough to turn, uh, for example, that uh, giant freighter over there. So a lot of power in those boats. Cement, cement Baltimore City's fireboats are stationed here at the edge of Fort McHenry on Locust Point. This facility has been in use since 1917, when it was established for Engine Company 39 with the steam fireboat Deluge. Today, the Marine Division operates two large fireboats, each with a crew of five, and two small fire rescue boats, each with a crew of two, manned full-time at Baltimore's only remaining fireboat station. The small brick building is now a Naval Reserve Training Center. Mentioned earlier, this building used to be the Immigration Center, where the settlers arrived and were processed in the same fashion as those at Ellis Island in New York. Fort McHenry. The grassy area at the end of Locust Point is Fort McHenry. It is named for James McHenry, who served with George Washington during the Revolutionary War. During the War of 1812, it was the only protection for Baltimore. In September of 1814, British ships had already burned Washington, D.C., and had pledged to take Baltimore and clean out what they referred to as that nest of pirates on the Chesapeake. British troops landed a few miles away at North Point and attempted to capture Baltimore. On September 13th, a bombardment of Fort McHenry began. A young attorney, Francis Scott Key, had been called to negotiate the release of a hostage being held by the British on a neutral vessel. He was successful and the hostage was released, but the British detained Key on board. The battle continued through the stormy night of rain, thunder, and lightning. He could not tell who was winning or if the fort had survived. Early on the morning of September 14th, he heard the morning gun at the fort and knew it had resisted the British. And he saw British ships sailing out of the river. He looked out from the ship and saw the largest American flag ever made, 30 by 42 feet, flying over the fort the young poet sat down and composed four verses called The Defense of Fort McHenry, later set to music and renamed the Star-Spangled Banner. It became our official national anthem in 1931. The spot where Key actually wrote the poem on the British ship is now memorialized by a red, white, and blue buoy near the Francis Scott Key Bridge, a four-lane suspension bridge completed in 1977. And guys, as we uh, start to make our turn here, just a couple quick notes. Uh, first of all, you might have noticed on that flag, 15 stars and 15 stripes. Uh, at that point in our history, they were adding a star and a stripe for each new state, not just a uh, star that they do now. Uh, shortly after, they realized that wasn't a really sustainable policy, so they went back to the original 13. 
Uh, out there you can see the Francis Scott Key Bridge, the massive boat that's about to go under it is a car carrier. Uh, you can see over here also on our right that sort of black and white, uh, just looks like a, a box boat over there. Car carrier, uh, Baltimore is the third largest row row port or roll on roll off port uh, in the United States. Uh, that's Fairfield over here. The side that we're heading towards is Dundalk. Dundalk is where most of the actual container ship traffic uh, happens. Uh, the Baltimore Container Port has been named the most uh, efficient port uh, in the United States for three years in a row. Uh, they have the capacity to move one and a half containers per minute, and they frequently do that, which is pretty insane if you ask me. Uh, that white uh, tower over there is a replica. Twenty-seven hundred Liberty ships built between 1941 and 1945. These were called the cargo carrying key to victory and were built to carry vital military equipment and supplies to troops. about the uh, B&O grain terminal over there inside. 